to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ to the elders in the lord's church in ephesus the apostle paul said so now brethren I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Acts chapter 20, verse number 32. What are some of the most uplifting and encouraging verses in all of Scripture? Stay tuned as we look to those verses that encourage us today from the Word of God. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. The Bible is full of encouraging verses, verses that challenge us, verses that motivate us, and verses that build us up to ever live more faithful to Almighty God. And today, we want to talk about some of those verses that really encourage and uplift every child of God. When you read your Bible and when you walk away being uplifted, what are some of the verses that do exactly that? We want to begin today with one of the most beautiful verses, I think, in all of Scripture, Psalm 103, verse number 10. Would you notice this verse with me? Notice Psalm 103, verse 10. The Bible says of God, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. When we think about uplifting verses, it, you'd be hard pressed to find one greater than this. Who is the God that I serve and the God that you serve? What's God really like? Friend, the Bible says of God, God did not deal with us according to our sin. God is not willing, if at all possible, through His Son to punish us according to our iniquities. What does that verse teach me? It teaches that we didn't get what we deserve for sin. God is a merciful and loving and forgiving God who is able through Christ's sacrifice to forgive and to overlook the sins of men. You see, my friend, this is so encouraging because of what sin has the power to do. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, verse 23. The soul that sins shall surely die. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. The Lord's ear is not heavy that He cannot hear. His arms not shortened that He cannot save. Isaiah said, But your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. Friend, this is something that all of us need to hear because 
all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm encouraged, I'm motivated to serve God because God is willing to forgive our sins. I didn't get what I deserved for my sin and nor did you if you've obeyed the gospel. You see, forgiveness is one of the beautiful ideas of Scripture. God is seen as ready to forgive. Psalm 86, verse number 5. The Bible teaches that, that God is a God who's not only able to forgive, but to forget. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, God said, in verses 12 and 13, I'll be merciful to their sins, their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. And like Micah said in Micah 7 verses 18 and 19, God is pictured as, though it were, casting all our sins into the depths of the sea. Now you think about the practical encouragement from this. The things I've done in my life and the things you've done in your life that are wrong, and we all know what those are, the things I've said that are wrong, the actions I've committed that were contrary to the will of God, the things that we're now ashamed of. The God we serve has completely forgiven us of those sins. But friend, let's realize that forgiveness comes at a huge price. Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 28, as He instituted the Lord's Supper, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 24, the Bible says of Christ, He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. And friend, let's realize the time at which God does forgive sin as well. Acts chapter 2, when they've heard for the very first time the good news about Jesus. The Bible says when they realized they'd killed their own Messiah, they were cut to the heart and cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here was the clarion voice of God. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Isn't it encouraging to know I don't have to worry about my past life? Look at it this way. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, If anyone is in Christ, that's a Christian. If anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Now notice this, Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. A second encouraging verse that we find in Scripture takes us all the way back to the time of David found in Psalm 23. I want you to notice the beautiful words of this psalm that give us so much encouragement. Beginning in verse number one, the psalmist says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, just reading words like that from the mouth of God bring each of us a sense of strength to know that God is the Good Shepherd, that just as a Good Shepherd, He's going to feed, He's going to protect, and He's going to take care of His own, gives us such hope and comfort. This is why the psalmist said, since the Lord is my shepherd, I don't have to want. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be eaten up with anxiety. I don't have to uh, fuss over what's going to happen in this life. The Bible says, cast all your cares on the Lord. Cast all your anxieties on the Lord. He cares for you. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by supplement, prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. 1 Peter 5, 7 and Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8. God is also seen in this passage as the one who can lead us, maybe even through some of the most difficult times in life. Listen again to these words. Yea, the psalmist says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? I don't have to walk it alone. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they do comfort me. During the dark times of life, whether it be sickness, whether it be a crisis, whether it be even a time of death, I'm so encouraged by knowing God's there with me. 
that God is there to help me, that I'm not alone that I can trust in the Lord with all my heart. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. That just as the Hebrew writer said, the Lord has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And thus, for the child of God, he doesn't have to go through those difficult times alone. God goes with him. God helps him during those times. And we take great strength and encouragement by knowing that. And for the child of God, that valley of the shadow of death, it's not the worst thing that could happen. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. Their works do follow them. Revelation 14, verse number 13. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. And so just like with the idea of forgiveness in Psalm 103, verse 10, we take strength in knowing the Good Shepherd will always take care of us. He'll always walk beside us. And if we remain true to Him, we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A third encouraging passage that we think about in Scripture is one that brings each one of us hope and encourages us to live faithfully to the Lord. In Psalm chapter 46 and verse 1, the psalmist teaches us that God is our source of help. Would you notice these words with me? The psalmist said, God is our refuge and strength. Now notice this, a very present help in trouble. Do you ever feel like you need strength? Do you ever feel like you need help in this life? Do you ever feel like that maybe Satan's got you down and you just can't hardly get up? That life throws you a curveball and sometimes you just feel like throwing in the towel? Let's realize God is our help. Hebrews 2 verses 16 through 18 says we can come boldly to God that He's able to aid those who are in any kind of trouble and we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. I have not been left without help, nor have you. Who is that help? God is our help. He's our refuge. You know, when you think of a refuge, you think of a place where you can go to escape from something. You think of a, a place of safety. You think of maybe the uh, cities of refuge in the Old Testament where if somebody had committed some crime against another person, if they could make it to that city of refuge, all would be okay. They could rest easy. They could breathe a sigh of relief. All that burden could be lifted from their shoulders. God is that city of refuge. God is that safe haven in my life and yours. He is that source of strength. Remember Philippians 4.13? When you think about God and Christ being our strength, you can't help but think of this verse. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then, friend, let's realize God is a present help. The Bible says in Psalm 46.1 that He is a very present help in trouble. I understand the distance and time that separates and things like unto that nature that separate us from God, but do we not realize that God is able to help us? That He is able through His Word, through the example of Jesus, through the power of prayer, through the encouragement of other Christians to help us in our time of trouble? Providentially, God is able to aid those who need His help, and thus what an encouraging passage this is. Another passage that would be at the top of that list is found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 7. The context of this is Christians having to do battle against Satan. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Christians needing to resist him steadfast in the faith. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 9. And in the midst of that great battle and striving to resist sin and Satan, listen to what Peter says. Notice these words. Casting all your care upon Him, He cares for you. The King James Version says, Casting all your anxiety upon Him, He cares for you. Literally, the Greek idea is to hurl, to throw it at God, to let God help you with the anxieties and the cares that we have. And so, again, we find the idea that when I struggle with things I don't know how to deal with, when, when life gets me tied up in knots, when I do have anxiety and problems that arise, what do I do with those problems? Give them to God. Cast all your cares upon Him. God is more than able to bear the load, to bear the burden, and to help me with that difficulty. He's able to aid those 
who need help. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. But then, just as much as knowing that God is able to help, which Psalm 46, 1 teaches as well, I believe this verse expresses something so beautiful in the last part. Look at 1 Peter 5, 7 again. Cast all your cares upon Him. Why? He cares for you. Friend, people need to know. God's people need to know. All mankind needs to know. Listen to this very carefully. The God of heaven cares for you. The God of heaven loves you. The God of heaven has a special place in His heart for me and you. That's the kind of God that we serve. A loving, caring, benevolent, merciful God. That's why we can cast... You know, it's really a play on words. Cast your cares on Him. He cares for you. God, in essence, is saying, since I care for you so much, since I have worry over you, let me help you with the desires and cares that you have in this life. Friend, just to know that the God who spoke and this world came into existence, just to know that the God who sent His own Son to this world cares for me, gives me great strength and encouragement every day to live faithfully to the Lord. You see, I know God cares for me and you because when Jesus illustrated our need and God knowing our need, you know, one of the passages He used says that God knows the very number of hairs on our head. Now you think about the detail, the intricacy, the minute detail of knowing every hair on every person's head. Is that a figure of speech to show just how much God cares? Absolutely. And friend, you think about the nature of that idea and then realize just how valuable I am and you are to God. There's another passage, I believe, that gives us great hope and encouragement. And I want to direct your attention to Hebrews chapter 13. I believe this would be right up at the top of my favorite verses in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 13. Notice what verses 5 and 6 teaches about the ever-present love of God. The Bible says... Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For He Himself has said, listen to what God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Why should I live a life without covetousness? Why should I be, why do I not have to worry about, well, Joe over here's got this and I'd like to have it and I really want it. Why do I have to not worry about that? Why do I need to be content with what I have? Because God has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, you can say, now this is in contrast to what others might have. What is it that you have? that is greater than anything anybody else could have. I don't have to covet somebody's house. I don't have to covet somebody's car. I don't have to covet somebody's bank account. Why not? Because you possess and I possess something far greater than anybody else could ever have. The Lord has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you so that you may boldly say, here's what you possess. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What could you possess greater than the Lord is your helper? Friend, there's nothing in all the world. And thus, the, the idea that God will never leave us. You know, one of the things that often happens in this life is that, sadly, sometimes friends or family or loved ones who are close to us choose to go down another path. And at times, they do abandon us. And that's difficult, and that hurts, and, and that's something that we all look toward with sadness. What's different about God? I'll never, God says, listen to these encouraging words, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God will never, ever, ever abandon His children. He'll never leave them. He'll never forsake them. They'll never be left out to dry on their own. God's going to take care of them. And friend, in view of that, that's why we can say with great joy and contentment, the Lord's my helper. No need for me to fear. What can man do to me? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God's on our side, we can do all things through Christ. 
who strengthens us and gives us the hope and encouragement that we desperately need in this life. Now, I want to mention two or three other passages that also bring us great encouragement in this life. And one of those is found in 2 Corinthians 8, verse number 9. I believe this is one of the most beautiful passages about the motivating, encouraging love of Christ. Listen to this verse. Notice it on their screen. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. The Bible says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might be made rich. You just stop and think about all that is said in that verse. The grace of Christ. We're talking about His unmerited favor. That which he did, which was not demanded, which he did not have to do, which he selfishly did anyway. What is that grace? Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. Let's translate that and translate that in the language that we can understand. Jesus was in the very place I'm striving every day to go, heaven. Out of the ivory palace, the palaces, the psalmist said he came into a world of sin and sorrow. And in this place, he left heaven and lived among sinners. They laughed at him. They mocked him. They said he's Beelzebub, the chief of the demons. They eventually took him and nailed him to a cruel Roman cross and there crucified him as a common criminal. That we, through his poverty, might be made rich by what Jesus did, by the life that He lived, by the good that He went around doing, I can ultimately one day live in that place called heaven. Friend, can you see just how much Jesus loves you? Can you see just how much He wants you to be His child and to live with Him forever in heaven? He wants it so much, He left heaven, came to this earth, lived as a, a, a poor man, and gave up His own life so that one day I could live with Him? Friend, I'll assure you, no one has ever loved you and no one's ever loved me the way Jesus loves us. That it motivates and encourages more than you can ever begin to imagine. Uh, another verse that encourages Christians so much is found in Psalm 116, verse 15. And this passage teaches us that that last day, that final day, when the curtain falls and I breathe my last. It's not a bad thing for a child of God. The scripture says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Friend, I want to ask you this today. How does heaven, I'm not talking about how do we view it, how does heaven view when one of God's children dies? Listen to that again. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Why is that? That person who's a child of God no longer has to fight that fight. That person no longer has to face the temptation, no longer has to face the struggle, and ultimately they have been rewarded with the crown of life. In fighting the good fight and finishing the faith, they've received the crown of life in heaven and in the presence of God they can be for all eternity. Do we realize that that thing that bothers us probably as much as anything else that day that we have no clue when it's going to come, but we can see that it is surely approaching swiftly. It doesn't have to be a dark, dreary day. You know, the world looks at death as a dr dark, dreary, sad, sorrowful day that, to be mourned and looked at in great darkness. Not God. And for the Christian, we don't have to look at it that way either. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And so does death have to be a, a bad thing for a child of God? Do we have to look at that as a dark and dreary day? Of course not. As Christians, we get a second chance in Christ. Now, I want to mention to you a couple of other verses that go hand in hand. The first is 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. And here's what we learn of God. We learn about God's universal love and desire for all men to be saved. The Bible says who desires of God, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. What's so encouraging about the God we serve? Friend, the God of the Bible is not a prejudiced God 
The God of the Bible does not have some of the prejudice that men do today based on maybe econ economic status, based on job, based on skin color, based on other factors. No, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And of course, the Bible teaches that that can be possible for every person if they will submit to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and God wants every one of His children to be faithful unto death so that they can receive the crown of life. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. Friend, as we think today about some of these encouraging verses that, that uplift us so much from the Bible, I want to ask you a serious question. Do these verses really impact your life because you're a child of God and because you know you're right with Him? If not, then friend, the strength these verses provide is not yet yours, but it can be. Are you willing to become a Christian? Are you willing to submit your life to the will of God? You don't want to miss out on the great promises, the, the precious blessings, the wonderful encouragement we've talked about today. But if you're not God's child, if you're not a Christian, then sadly, you are missing out on the wonderful blessings of being a child of God. What does one have to do to become a child of God? Friend, it's not hard. The Bible teaches that to become a Christian, I must first hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. After hearing the message about Jesus, I then must commit to it and believe in Him. Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely perish in your sins. John 8 verse 24. Having believed that Jesus is the Savior of the world, I I've got to turn from a life of sin and repent. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Having confessed the name of Jesus, Romans chapter 10, verse number 10, I then must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus said it so plainly. In Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And so friend, if you're not a child of God, we encourage you today, become a Christian. Be encouraged every day to live faithful to Almighty God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.